Hi everyone. So welcome to to this week's uh, webinar. This week's right on right on webinar. I'll begin by introducing myself. My name is Dr. Andrew Fagan. I am the director of the Human Rights Centre at the University of Essex and one of the key partners in this particular venture that delivers these series of webinars, right on webinars to you. This is a uh, season two. Episode two, I believe, of, of season two. We began last uh, April of, of this year, engaging with the many challenges that COVID raises for the human rights community. And we're continuing with that particular venture now. So thank you so much for giving up your time to, uh, to, to, to spend with us now over this, over this next hour. Um, <clears throat> I'll begin with, a, with a, what's now become something of a tradition, really, for, for the Rights on Webinar series in, in terms of saying good morning to the Americas, good afternoon to Europe, Africa and the Middle East, and good evening to, to Asia. I suppose I should add almost good night almost to, to Australasia too. Thank you for joining us for a new Rights on Web Chat focused on today, focused on human rights and the precarious condition of electoral democracy. It is widely assumed and frequently asserted that human rights and electoral democracy are mutually supportive and inextricably connected. There can be little doubt that the regular holding of free and fair democratic elections is, of course, essential for citizens' enjoyment of the full range of human rights. However, we are presently confronted by a range of different challenges to the democratic process within both long-established and transition transitional electorally democratic countries. With less than a week remaining to what is likely to be the most contested and fraught US presidential election in decades, this webinar will consider the precarious condition of electoral democracies in these very challenging times. During the right on discussion, we will look both at the challenges faced by electoral democracies around the world, especially in the context of the increasing impact that new digital technologies have on the electoral process, as well as some good practice case studies on how the use of new technologies can lead to more participatory and inclusive democratic processes. I will be co-moderating the session today together with my colleague uh, Danica Damplo from U Universal Rights Group based in New York. But we also want to involve all of you in the audience. So please use the chat room to send in your comments and questions. In the first part of this webinar, we will have a dialogue between the moderator and the panelists and in the second part, we will bring in your questions to continue the dialogue with the experts. Today, we have an esteemed group of experts lined up for you to take this discussion forward. With us, we have Dr. Kathleen Kavanagh, who's the Executive Director of the Posen Family Center for Human Rights at the University of Chicago. Mr. Peter Wolf, who's a Senior Analyst at International IDEA. And last, but most certainly not least, with us today is also Kaylee Long, who's a researcher at Amnesty International. A warm and thank you, a warm and very large thank you for being with us all today. Before we hand over the floor to the experts, we would like to hear or rather see what our audience thinks about one of the issues we are currently engaging with today. Forgive me for one moment. For the use of a, a word cloud, which is beyond me, apologies to my my, uh, my technical ignorance here. Um, to participate, please type menti.com. You're seeing on the screen in front of you precisely what you need to do to, to take part in this first, this first survey. The question is, what is the greatest threat currently posed to electoral democracies around the world? We will come back to the results after the first speaker. So now moving on to the panelists for this right on, right on session. I'm going to turn first to our first panelist and we will start today's discussion with Dr. Kathleen, Kathleen Kavanaugh. Kathleen, thank you for joining us. Very welcome. I'm, I'm gonna go straight into the, into the first question um, that we have for you. And it is as follows. Tom Ginsburg and Aziz Hook in their recent book have argued that there is a democratic backsliding which is taking place in many democracies worldwide and that this has led to erosion or decay and potentially democratic collapse. How do you see this process unfolding in the US? Kathleen, you have roughly three minutes to, to address this first question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
So firstly, I think for the benefit of the audience, it's useful to talk about what Ginsburg and Huck have laid out as preconditions for constitutional democracies. And I'll go very quickly into answering the question after that. The first is a competitive electoral politics, which provides a level playing field for all parties. Second, that each vote of every individual counts just for one vote and no one should be privileged or disadvantaged in exercising that vote, the right to free speech and the rule of law. Now, this kind of minimalist institutional approach to understanding democracy they have flagged poses a very key problem or doesn't specifically address a very key problem. And that is that each of the institutional manifestations of those norms and principles can be subverted in a number of ways. And they list two that I think is particularly important in the context of what's happening today in the United States. The first is the rise of populism, where you have an entrepreneurial leader who uses the public square to appeal to social groups uh, who detest inherent privilege, distrust institutions, and above all, resent others. And there you can read the questions related to immigrants, for example. And in the public square, the argument is those, even if they are here lawfully, those that are othered are appropriating land, resources, and of course, employment. And the second, they argue that when this is combined with the threat that curbs the autonomy of the media, whether it's through corporate leaderships or and or an irresponsible social media, you produce democratic erosion that can actually lead to democratic collapse. And I think therein, in that last two um, notations is where we're seeing the U.S. political landscape right now. Kathleen, thank you. That was a very, a very, um, very concise answer. Thank you so much. Let me just follow up, really, uh, on, on a couple of those points. Uh, some of my own research has, has been engaging with populism and the the challenges that it raises for human rights. And I have to say, I'm a political philosopher by by uh, by training, by background. I, I struggle with the the notion of populism within the context of democratic theory and whether populism itself is really the appropriate term that we we ought to be using. Uh, as Democrats and as human rights supporters, I know it's become a, a, you know, the, the, the term of art, in effect, uh, for, for negotiating and for, for inscribing, as it were, these, these conversations and these discussions. But I wondered if you had any, any thoughts on the, on the appropriateness of populism as a term for describing accurately the kinds of phenomena that Donald Trump, for example, the kinds of policies and position that Donald Trump has been, has been advocating these past three and a half years. Well, that's an interesting question, Andrew. I think we use it because it's the nomenclature of the moment, right? But I think certainly what Trump has um, played into is a sort of emotionalism. And if you go back to Lowenstein and talking about issues related to militant democracy, the idea that you're able to key into emotion in order to be able to ferment uh, a movement, a collect, almost a collective social movement and agreement uh, of certain political philosophies or certain philosophies or ideologies around which you center um, your uh, appeal. And I think that's what Trump has done. And it is kind of fermenting in this form of collective engagement that doesn't really have a clear political agenda, but it has a certain degree of opposition to the other. Um, and that I think he has done quite well. So however we want to label this and whether or not it's too easy to put the term populism, it certainly has tapped into something that is very much about the opposition of the other. So you support Donald Trump because inherent, not because you think he's managed things very well, but you are against the principles that you see the other as having. And you're able to actually uh, tap into that streak and formulate a movement um, that is surrounding by this charismatic leader. And I think certainly charismatic, not necessarily in the positive, but more for, for me anyway, in the pejorative sense in, in the form of Donald Trump. Do you think a Biden victory will, will, will put much of that to bed, Kathleen? Or do you think it will, it will resurface and express itself in different ways? You know, there's very interesting literature on um, the rise of movements themselves that indicate that once you actually are able to populate the public square, it's very hard to put it back. So I think uh, and the election of Biden will change some of the institutional erosion 
that the Trump administration has been able to make through executive orders. But I think you're not going to be able to discount a minority, but a significant minority, some put it as high as 40%, that actually espouse and hold some of the same, I think, fake principles that Donald Trump has espoused, you know, this rise of Christianity, uh, Christian evangelicalism, this white nationalism, this very overt racism. I mean, we actually have overturned Iraq, and I'm not sure Biden's election is going to put it back, but what it will do is hopefully renegotiate um, the stacking of the Supreme Court, roll back some of the executive orders and provisions that have affected things like the EPA in the United States, to be able to do some of those things that, that Trump's been able to do by executive order, roll it back, have a constitutional committee to look at the composition of the Supreme Court, which is going to be particularly important. But more than Biden being elected, I think uh, what's important is who controls the Senate. And if the Senate are continue to be controlled by the Republican uh, Party, then I think we're going to see Biden's election not do very much for the political landscape in the United States. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much. So let's move on to, uh, to a second question for you, and it is as follows. Separation of powers has always been the backstop to protecting basic freedoms in the US. How has the 2016 elections tested, challenged um, this particular state of affairs? Thank I you. think by testing, sorry, by testing the very notion that there is a separation of powers. I mean, right now, the Republicans control a Senate that has adopted an approach to governing by exception. They are governing by the minority. And over the years, uh, just by happenstance of people stepping down or deaths on the U.S. Supreme Court, they've been able to appoint a large number of conservative and indeed activist Supreme Court justices. So this way right now is 6-3. And this blows apart the notion that there is any checks and balances, the term we tend to like to use here. And it goes back to us to the argument that many of uh, those, including Ginsburg and Huck, have made that, that when this um, separation of powers starts to uh, be blown apart or disrupted in any way, that the only uh, a rescue for uh, constitutional democracy is public action and collective mobilization. And this is the only thing that can neutralize democratic decline and erosion, but that presumes that the majority, and let's, for the sake of argument, assume there remains a majority of US citizens that are vested in democratic vehicles, are able to sufficiently lean into sites of power to ensure that their voices are heard. And this goes full circle that they can vote and that each vote is counted and no vote is either privileged or denied. And right now it's not an exaggeration to state that this is very much at risk. What can we do? What can the, the human rights community, um, the global and, and national US-based human rights community do to, to, to reaffirm the, 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 the urgency uh, of, of our need to protect these particular values, institutional separation of powers, for example, and constitutional rights, which are, which are ring-fenced and protected from the will of the majority or, or the will of a, a demagogue or, or whoever. What, what can we what can we begin to do? Are we, are we doing enough? Can we, is there more that we can do and should do? Well, I think the problem with doing something in terms of the U.S. landscape is that, you know, you can roll back to the days of the Bush regime um, and see that there has been a disengagement. Uh, of the US government from the international landscape, you know, this notion of exceptionalism and the pulling away from institutions, uh, including international human rights institutions that really do have a voice in this matter. So in short, I'm not sure the international community can do anything because the, the kind of rootedness of, of the discourse of exceptionalism is very much in the landscape right now. And it certainly has been resurrected under, under Donald Trump. I think the only thing that we can hope for, and this is a hope, this isn't going to be any kind of recipe is that the number of people you've seen on the street, um, the pushback, the ownership of the public square of the majority of people. And I do believe very strongly that a majority do not believe in this kind of Trumpism, if we prefer to use that term rather than popularism, um, is, the, is the will of the majority. And I, I have to hope that the vote on November 3rd will actually help to reclaim that space so we can start to rethink of what is necessary in a democratic society here in the States and start to re-embrace it. 
Definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much. We could we could discuss these particular themes um, for, for hours, I'm sure. But thank you. We need to we need to move on. Um, before we move on to our next speaker, to to Peter, to Peter Wolf, we have the results. I believe my colleagues behind working behind the scenes um, feverishly can provide us with the results of the of the word cloud survey. So they, I assume, are going to be coming up on the screen now. What is the greatest threat currently posed to electoral democracies around the world? <laughs> Trump, inequality, apathy, fake news, uh, rigging, trashing of expertise. Um, I'm bound to say I agree as an as a, as a alleged expert. COVID-19, transnational corporations, weak institutions, polarization, populism, uh, other populists like him, I imagine Trump, social media, emergency powers, no transparency, uh, extremism, and, and so on and so forth. There is so much that one could say there. It's interesting that fake news stands out so, so powerfully uh, and the, the need to report accurately and to indeed for the, 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 the media to play the role that it fundamentally has to play within a democracy, which is to provide voters with, with, with true or at least sufficiently accurate um, facts and, and accounts of how politicians are, are acting. So it's interesting to see uh, how 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 well ingrained now I think is our collective understanding and collective consciousness of just those those threats that are are being posed to democracy. I suppose the fundamental thing for us going forward, regardless of the outcome of the of the U.S. presidential election, is is what we do and how we do and how we we start to take responsibility for for promoting democracy more more effectively. Um, moving on and turning to our to our next speaker. Uh, Peter, thank you, thank you so much for for joining us. Um, I have uh, two questions for you. Let's begin with the first one. It's short and sweet, um, but I'm sure there's much that you can say to it, which is uh, as follows: What is the most important impact of digital technology upon electoral processes? Peter, you have particular expertise in this in this area. I'd be really interested to hear your your view on on this. Over to you. Yes, um, thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, as we prepared for this conference, I actually said, I think it's probably very important at the beginning um, of, of, of this topic um, to mention that digital technology actually is a broad range of, of technologies, of issues. And I think it's very important to um, distinguish a few of them because they all have their own opportunities, challenges and solutions. So I think the first area we should kind of stick out is um, elections technologies um, that is used for the electoral process per se. So just think about all the technologies um, that are used from voter registration to vote counting, um, e-voting, voter registration, biometrics, open data, all of those things. Of course, all of those can have a significant impact on the integrity of the electoral process. Um, also maybe address some of the concerns uh, that we heard on this uh, or saw on this is on, on this word cloud before. Um, the impact can be both positively and negatively. And I think um, this is actually an area where quite a lot of progress was made in recent years. I, I remember a few years ago, um, there was quite a, a divided um, expert um, community. Some people kind of saw this as a panacea for all kinds of uh, problems that might have plagued electoral processes around the world. Um, others being extremely skeptical about it, um, seeing no contribution at all technology can have. I think in the meantime, we learned a lot and we found quite a, a good middle ground um, about how technology can be used constructively, where this can happen. Um, but of course, we, we still see um, controversies arising as well, and, and, and not least also in the aftermath of the uh, US election in 2016, where all of the technology was linked to a lot of alleged real um, cyber issues, and, and that kept not only the US, but, but countries around the world um, looking into those technology in, in much more detail in recent years. I think one adv advantage we have um, with um, those electoral technologies is in a way that, that we, um, we meaning, I guess, legislators and electoral management bodies are kind of in the driver's seat, right? So in, in, in a way, we can throttle and decide how much of this we want and what's constructive and not and kind of turn it up or turn it on. And I think that's a quite big difference to the other challenge that, that we are seeing, of course, and that is what a lot of people will these days also understand. Um, under the impact of digital technology on, on the electoral process. And that is basically the impact of digitalization on the overall information environment around an election. Um, and I, I'd say even that information environment has, has, has a few different components. Um, on one hand, you've got the physical infrastructure. So just the basic access to internet, um, you know, even touching upon the right to access to internet, which exists in some countries and where some countries go out of the way to make sure the citizens have that. Um, but for sure, not everybody has this opportunity. 
And also in cases where it normally exists, you know, media blackouts and internet blackouts are a well-known um, method, of course, of, of curbing some of those, those rights of, of access to information as well. Um, but then beyond the physical um, um, infrastructure, there's also the, the, the issue of information flows, um, platforms. So this is where all of the social media issues uh, that have been mentioned on the word cloud um, before are, are falling as well. And there's a whole range of challenges in there as well. Of course, there's a concentration of power in some of those platforms. Um, they dominate a lot of the financial streams that, that go on the internet. Um, they, they can control the messages, how visible or not they become. They have control over the audiences. Um, they also have control and a very important control over the research that's happening, you know, algorithmic research, artificial intelligence that's being used in this field is becoming an increasingly important topic. Um, and, um, and then of course, there's this big question how all of this is being used for campaigning as well. So just normal political advertising moving more and more online. Um, are there limitations to this? Does this need more regulation or not? So that's kind of an ongoing debate where you see actually um, different kinds of progress being made in, in countries around the world. And then of course, um, the last impact is the human dimension as well. How, how um, do we all, how, how does the collective mind of the electorate um, respond to all of this? Um, how, how much can it be influenced? Um, and that kind of then contains all of those issues related to the echo chambers, um, also the risks of foreign interference we are hearing sometimes. Um, you know, it was called fake news on the slide before. I think maybe we should rather say the more neutral term, disinformation, misinformation, malinformation, all the various tools, the bots, the trolls, all of those kinds of things that are happening. So I think it's very important to note that those are all really uh, quite distinct problems that also have distinct expertise, um, distinct approaches, how, how to, to address them and to solve them as well. Um, I will also say my expertise is, on, is only in a few of them, electoral technologies on one hand, um, online campaigning, regulation of online campaigning is something else we looked at, um, at International Idea, and also at this um, emerging challenge of artificial intelligence and where this might be going, where this might be leading us um, into, into the future. Lisa, thank you. Thank you for such a, for such a detailed, wide-ranging wide-ranging answer. I'm, I'm going to ask you probably an unfair question, so apologies for this, but um, Facebook's defense of their own position as being a publisher, uh, or not being a publisher, being a, a platform in effect, uh, what's, your, what's your take on that? Do you think Facebook needs to, needs to unilaterally decide to do more, or is this something that we, that legislators need to, need to, um, to be robust, take a robust position on? And if so, what would that, for example, what would that consist of? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's one of the key or the regulatory questions, how to deal with social, social media platforms. Are they a medium? Are they just a, a platform um, that, that can push responsibility um, to the people that provide content? I think in the end, there is a growing consensus that something has to be done, right? I mean, we've seen that, you know, we have to be very careful about this, of course, as well. Um, when, when you talk to political parties, you know, with, even with the best interests, they say we have a hard time reaching our audiences, right? We have a hard time reaching the citizens for years. And all of a sudden, all of those platforms are giving us an opportunity that is unprecedented. And a lot of things that we normally discuss as the bad things that happen on social media are also seen as new um, opportunities. But of course, those opportunities are so powerful that, that there's an increasing recognition that something needs to be done about it. And it goes more and more also into the direction of uh, regulation. So not only relying on the platforms themselves, um, Facebook and others uh, to, to self-regulate, to provide their own mechanisms, um, but, but also to find out what can we actually do in, in terms of regulation. There's a lot of this, this discussions, especially also going on in Europe. It's quite a tricky field though. Um, there are some things that, that seem to be easier. So of course, transparency is gonna be a big part of, of any um, regulatory aspects there. Um, creating more uniform, for example, online advertising transparency, more access um, to anybody, how much is actually being spent there, what the messages are, how they are being targeted and so on. Um, but, but the question is still, of course, is, is, this, is this enough? Is more needed? Um, and it, it getting the, the, the further you go away from transparency, of course, the harder it's becoming. Um, in the end, you know, we're talk, talking about human rights and fundamental rights here, and, and this really touches on two um, very fundamental rights. Um, both actually in, in the um, Universal Human Rights Declaration and also in the ICCPR Article 19, both of them, you know, enshrine the right of freedom of expression on one hand, that can, on one hand, that can be easily limited by too much regulation online, but also they give everybody the right, of course, to hold opinions without interference. And 
the possibilities for interference are, um, of course, so big in, in social media that, that this is a, a, a real risk as well. And balancing that out is, I think, where all the regulators are struggling at the moment. So I guess a lot is transparent at the moment and everything else, I think we still have to make a lot more progress. You know, starting even from the basics, even the definition, what is even a political message? How do we filter them out? Could we regulate something that we can't really find really hard in the details? So you think we're at the very beginning of a process that has a long has a long way to run before we can come to any more satisfactory set of, of, of regulations? Absolutely. Is that fair? Right. Well, you know, I think transparency regulation is going to come pretty fast and it, it might not be so difficult to get. But like getting a better grasp of overall, you know, what are even, what is even the real risk, the real impact? You know, when you talk to regulators, they will even tell you, well, before we do anything, we'd really like to better understand, you know, really scientific research, what's the real impact? And, you know, the results of this are still very mixed. And so I think there is still a long way to go and, and uh, it's got to be really hard to come up with, with, with the solution. Here. Peter, thank you. So, so turning to my, my second question for you, um, again, a short but sweet, short but sweet question. Uh, from your focus on online political advertising, what, what do you see as the main challenges and opportunities in this particular area? Yeah, again, I, I would say that the opportunities for sure, what I, what I mentioned before already, is just a, a very effective and new way that hopefully can also connect parties better to, to the citizens, something that they've been lacking uh, for a long time. Um, but, but of course, um, yeah, as, as we said before, it, it, it's a powerful tool. It is also, you know, taking a bit of a global view maybe on this, because before you were discussing the US, I'm um, talking about the broad range of countries we are working with. The impact of those um, mechanisms is actually quite different. In, in, in some countries, um, they, they still tell us, well, our perception is, you know, this is not as a big issue. In others, especially the ones that have seen, of course, previous powerful online campaigns, they see this as a big issue. So clearly, the, the question of if and how far this needs to be limited, regulated, um, is, is a very big one. Um, maybe also an, an interesting suggestion that's kind of out in, in the discussion about the online campaign specifically and also micro-targeting, you know, all of the Cambridge Analytica issues that, that we've, dis we've been discussing um, around the last US elections. If it wouldn't be worth trying to limit online campaigning to a human scale. Um, when you look at how this can be done at the moment, millions of messages um, targeted to tiny groups. Nobody does understand anymore what kind of messages are being sent out, who receives those messages, who doesn't see what messages are going out. And if regulation could maybe not go somehow in the direction of limiting this to a human consumable scale, that you can see, well, this is what the campaign was. Those were the messages. Those were the groups. And at the moment, this is almost impossible. It's, it's, it's Tons of data um, also provided in very bad formats. So getting to the bottom of this is, is almost impossible. And of course, then greatly limiting, limiting the transparency of companies as well. So you're an optimist or a pessimist for the future and, and, and democracies, the impact of, 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 of all of this upon democracy. It's an unfair question, Peter. Apologies, but it's such a crude and generalized <laughs> question. But this is a, as a kind of hunch even. How do you, how do you feel about it? Well, I guess personally, I always tend to be an optimist, but those are, are uh, serious problems that, that uh, require a lot of work. You know, one way or another, we'll have to deal with this, right? As I said before, some of those technologies are a choice and we can, we can choose to adopt them or not, um, especially the stuff in the information environment. It's just going to be with us one way or another and we better find ways to deal with this. I don't think it's a hopeless case, but it's not entirely easy either. Peter, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and, and thank you for, for agreeing to, to participate in this particular webinar. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to move on. Uh, and before, uh, before we move on to our next, uh, our final and next panelist, we'd like to hear once more from, from you, from, from the audience. So we have a poll question. We understand that audiences uh, often like to respond to poll questions. Um, and the question is, is up on the screen in front of you. That the rise of social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, has brought the political debate closer to the electorate in general and non-politically engaged citizens specifically. Do you agree or do you disagree? I'm just going to allow that to run. If you could please enter your uh, responses uh, very quickly and I will briefly comment on it. I'll end the poll in the next 10, 15 seconds or so. Um, at the moment, we have an interesting Interesting divide, actually. Often these polls split 50-50 down the middle. But uh, OK, what we have at the moment is that 71% of you agree that the rise of social media has brought the political debate closer to the electorate in general and non-politically engaged citizens specifically. An interesting, interesting finding. 29% of you 
uh, disagree. That's, that's such a an interesting thing and worthy worthy of discussions. Unfortunately, we, we're going to have to um, we're going to have to move on to uh, to to our next our next speaker, uh, who is Kaylee Long from Amnesty International. Kaylee, again, thank you so much for for joining us. Um, really appreciate the, the time that you've given up. I know that you have expertise in an area that I have also worked on, um, albeit some some years ago, which is on Myanmar and the developing. Um, if one can put it in inverted commas, democratization process in uh, in Myanmar. Uh, moving on from the remarks on electoral democracy, of course, which is what we can focus upon in general, we're now moving to a more specific case study of Myanmar uh, and a country where a crucial general election, of course, will be taking place in, in 10 days' time. Um, Kelly, welcome. I'm, I'm going to go straight into the first question. Time as ever is, is against us. It's a, it's a short question, but it's a, it raises many different many different issues. So the question is this. What are the most pressing human rights issues in Myanmar at present as we approach the election on November the 8th? Kelly, if you could, in about three minutes, um, give your views in, in response to that question. Thank you. The airways are silent from Kelly. Kelly, could you? That's just me. Can you hear me? My computer's playing up again. It's very, um, <clears throat> it's very broken up and very, very disjointed at the moment, Kelly. Do you want to give it another, another go? Sure, sorry. Um, so, I guess, uh, for general background, is it sounding slightly better? Yes, Kelly. Again, it's a very disjointed, disjointed and broken, broken line. Apologies for that. I don't know if there's anything you could do to, to get to move it to move closer to the or um, to your server or to. Yeah, um, hopefully this will be, I mean, at the moment, I've had to between three connections, it's really bad today for some reason. Um, so in general, the human rights issues facing our reason in Myanmar, uh, on topic is really really to trouble at the moment, and in particular in Japan. Kaylee, Kaylee, I'm so <laughs> sorry. Um, we really, it's really not a, the line isn't working, I'm afraid. Um, so listen, I'm going to speak very briefly. I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to fill the gap, if you if you will, for for a moment. If you want to try and um, play around with your with your connection in some way, or do whatever you need to do, then then we'll come back to you perhaps in the next minute or two. Uh, I mean, uh, my own just for for the sake of of uh, filling in for for Kelly at the moment. My own um, my own engagement with with Myanmar extends back to 2010. I was uh, I was invited uh, with a colleague of mine, Kevin Boyle, who, uh, who unfortunately was ill at the time, was unable to travel. But we were invited by a former student to go and conduct human rights training uh, in Myanmar, uh, providing human rights training, intensive human rights training for a group of people, including senior people within the NLD, um, various ethnic ethnic minority parties, um, some Buddhist monks too, and our efforts were to to try and show how. An otherwise extremely divided um, political opposition might unite around a shared set of, of human rights principles and human rights ideals. Um, I was there for about 10 days, uh, carried on working with various organizations uh, remotely, then returned again the following year uh, with another colleague of mine, Tara Van Ho. Uh, we conducted some training on, on business and, and human rights in, in particular. Uh, all of which, of course, was delivered in, in good faith and all of which was delivered in, in the hope that we were contributing to what many people believed, I think, at the time would be a, a, a more <laughs> a sufficiently effective human rights respecting democracy under, under Aung San Suu Kyi uh, and under the, the National League for, for Democracy government. Unfortunately, as we know, that has not come about. Um, I remember at the time actually having conversations with, with senior diplomats um, based in, in Yangon and saying that the Rohingya issue was, was a profound challenge for, for, the, uh, for the Burman in particular and for many supporters of the NLD to actually come to terms with, to accept that their own identity would be, could be reconciled, protecting their own identity, particularly the identity of, of the Buddhist um, majority could somehow... Be, be sustained whilst recognizing the Rohingya as one, a bona fide ethnic community within, within Myanmar, and two, therefore entirely uh, appropriate and entitled to have full human rights uh, and be able to participate in the, in the political process in, in Myanmar. Um, that's not turned out to be the case. There are different perspectives upon that. Some people say that really 
Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi in particular has simply been unable to come out from underneath the, the sort of the yoke, as it were, of, uh, of the Tatmadaw, of the military. Um, and then there are others who actually see her relationship as being much more invidious than that and much more, much closer actually to, to the military than, than, than one would like to think is the case. I suppose it's a, it's a rather depressing case study in how, how easily we, the human rights community, can get it wrong if we don't sufficiently understand the realities and the challenges of, of communities of people on the ground and assume that simply um, we can promote ideals and values and institutions and training and, and, and all the rest of it uh, and assume that that's going to deliver the kinds of hu the positive human rights consequences that we would like to see. Many of you, of course, will notice that there are there's a, the next general election, the second general election in effect is taking place on the 8th of November uh, and the likely outcome, of course, is another another national um, League of Democracy government. There may well be an increased share of the vote from the ethnic minority parties, and that may place some pressure upon, upon Aung San Suu Kyi and her government to take a slightly different view to the peace process and a slightly different view to recognizing more effectively um, the sort of federal structure that Myanmar is, is based upon. Um, unlike Peter, I'm, I'm, I'm not really an optimist. I, I tend to have rather pessimistic views on many things, to be honest with you, and I, I think this is probably one of those. Um, the, the capacity of the West to make much of a contribution is rather limited, um, if only because of the, the, the influence and, and the sway that China has in, in that region and particularly over, over Myanmar. So apologies, everyone, and, and apologies to Kaylee for, for not being able to connect. This is part of the, 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 the rather complicated world, the Zoom world that we're all inhabiting um, now. What I'm going to do is to... Um, is to assume that Kaylee is not able to, to join us, which is a, a great shame, um, and to pass the floor <laughs> without further ado, uh, to pass the, the floor over to my co-moderator um, based in New York, which is Danica Damplow from the University of Rights Group. Danica, the floor is, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hopefully I'll have better luck than Kaylee with, uh, with technology. Um, over here. Thank you so much for, for having us here. As, um, as Andrew said, my name is Danica Damplow and I work with the New York Office of Universal Rights Group, uh, where we work a lot on human rights and democracy. So we'll be very interested in this topic beyond uh, what happens next week. So we're very happy to be involved today. And I want to thank everyone for a very lively uh, discussion in the chat and quite a few questions. So uh, we will be able to have a discussion with our two speakers who are able to, to uh, connect today. So I will be able to convey some questions from our audience. Um, I'm going to convey the questions, uh, all of the questions, and then pass the floor back for our speakers to uh, respond. So the first two questions for uh, Kathleen. Uh, one from um, is a question and comment from uh, one question we have is, uh, what can be made? Uh, what can be made of Article Twenty Five of the ICCPR and the Human Rights Committee's General Comment Twenty Five in the defense of democracy? And the other question um, is, if uh, it's sort of a comment and, and question. Uh, from Fernando Sandoval, if Trump is able to break rules in the democracy, including electoral ones, is this more of a systemic problem and not just uh, related to Trump? And if so, how can this be um, avoided in the future? Uh, and then there's another question that also came up. So if there is time, um, if you wanted to respond to that as well, um, in response to your comments on characterizing the emotionalism underpinning Trumpism as negative, is that because in this case, the, it is an ideology based on opposition to another, could emotionalism, so to speak, also galvanize other social movements that are inclusive um, as opposed to divisive? And then our questions from the audience for Peter Wolf. We have a question from Peter Splinter. Um, do you have anything to say about the role of electoral commissions in regulating the use of social media platforms in election campaigns in ensuring that campaigning on social media respects electoral rules of general application? And then also, do Facebook and Twitter's actions ahead of the U.S. elections in terms of preventing disinformation and foreign interference go far enough? Can private companies be relied upon alone or do governments need to do more to regulate? So thank you very much. I'm going to pass the floor back to the, our panelists. 
Uh, Danica, it might be really helpful because I don't write that fast and I'm not sure if Peter's going to be any better at, than this not to all in one go because um, I'm not going to remember all of them. All right, so, do you want me to? Yeah, so let me, uh, let me try uh, to, firstly, you know, I'm, I'm good at stuff, but I did not remember what Article 25 of the ICCPR even is. Um, and I'm not sure if the... Uh, if the audience will as well. So um, just to say it's every citizen will have the right and opportunity without any distinctions mentioned in Article 2 without unreasonable restrictions to take part in the conduct of public affairs directly or through freely chosen representatives. Um, and I'm not really sure I understand the question that the, um, the person put. So can you repeat it for me, please? Sure, it's still related to the ICCPR or the question? Yeah. No, no, the Trump question I have. The oh, okay, ICCPR sure. The question I'm just a little confused okay. by. Okay, so the, well, so the, okay, so you would like more information about the ICCPR question? Yes, please, just to um, repeat it. So what use can be made of Article 25 of the ICCPR and the Human Rights Committee's General Comment 25 in the defense of democracy? Or I suppose more broadly than an international instrument such as the ICCPR. Right. So I assume because what I'm speaking about is the U.S. context, it's in the U.S. context this question is being asked because I'm not going to be able to argue that question or answer it more broadly. But as I, I think Andrew already touched upon this in terms of what can the international community do, what can human rights activists do, what can um, the U.N appendages under, under treaty base do. And my argument is not going to be a particularly useful one, but within the US context, not very much right now, because I think this has been uh, a construction, as I noted, since the Bush regime, but even prior to that, to really disassociate the United States from the international community very purposefully to pull back from international institutions, to argue sovereignty, to argue this period of exclusion is really based on the fact that we already have a constitution and a bill of rights that do it better. And anything that interferes from the outside is seen as the other. And that construction of the political narrative has actually been very effective. So this kind of guarantee to effectively participate in public life and in this particular context, it's through the vote. As I noted, because there have been so many attempts to disenfranchise voters is really at risk. And I think the remedy for that is not going to happen within the international forum. It's going to happen domestically. Mm -hmm. So the second question, if you wouldn't mind repeating on Trump. Yes. Uh, if Trump is able to break rules in a democracy, including electoral ones, perhaps it is a systemic prob systematic problem and not just about Trump. How can we avoid this in the future? So that question is absolutely spot on. This is not about Donald Trump. Um, this is very much about a system that's broken, the historical hangovers of the construction of the U.S. Constitution, which really did, at least at its very infancy, was meant to have political representation across the country. And so, for example, you have a very weird system right now where you have a minority of people represented by a majority of U.S. senators. And that really has put the urban rule tilt which in my view has made it not representative of we the people, but representative of a small portion of the people. And once they've assumed sites of power, in this case, the US Senate, they've also been able to change a lot of the rule book, like the stacking of the US Supreme Court. Um, and so I think this is a problem now in the US landscape that's being looked at very carefully. So for example, do we relook and reimagine the electoral college? Do we start to relook at the idea of proportionality where you have two senators per state, regardless of the number of people living in that state? And do we start to put together, as Joe, Joe Biden has indicated he would, a, con a committee to look at the composition of the Supreme Court and see what kind of mechanics we can put in play to make the court less bipartisan. Thank you. Um, we have, so the third question that we had for you was about the emotionalism 
um, that you mentioned. The question was, um, I think you are characterizing the emotionalism underpinning Trump as negative, perhaps because it is an ideology based on opposition to the other. Could emotionalism also galvanize social movements that would be inclusive of the other? Well, I think it's very nice. So I, I use the term emotionalism to kind of invoke Lowenstein's uh, thesis on militant democracy. And there, the emotionalism is seen as irrational, um, as seen as not tied to either the progression or the engagement with ideas, but really tied to this question of opposition of the other. And I don't see that as being particularly effective when you talk to progressives. And even in the U.S. in a very simplistic anecdotal way, when you're having discussions in this particular environment, the moment those discussions fall on uh, differentiation lines, the moment the exchange of information actually is muted. And so it becomes a discussion of, of either you're for a particular version of what you think this country should be in Donald Trump's world or under Trumpism, or you are liberal or progressive. And so for me, emotionalism, going back to Lowenstein's idea, is something that can never be used to actually break down those barriers and to move ahead agendas. It's something to unite solely in opposition of the other. Mm -hmm. And it's not part of the liberal discourse right now in the United States it's about fixing things rather than shifting blame as to why things are broken onto this other group of people. So I'm not seeing that as a, a natural mm -hmm. alignment. Okay, thank you for going into a little bit more detail with that, that description, and that's incredibly helpful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. I think we'll switch over then to Peter. I'm happy to, to read the questions again, if that would be helpful, but I don't know if you've had time to sort of do some writing and mulling. I took notes, so I think I'm okay. I'm kind of okay. <laughs> and actually, maybe I can just quickly pick up this previous question about the ICCPR and maybe other international obligations as well. And the question, do they even help? Are they useful at all? And I think it, it probably depends a lot on the country as well. Um, you know, when you look at international election observation and, you know, that in turn then also informs how the international community reacts to what's going in the country, um, how it, what kind of um, actions it ex expects on the way forward and so on. Those international obligations are really important as, you know, a common denominator that you can refer to. I mean, you can't just go and observe and, you know, randomly make comments based on the opinions of the team. Um, so for international observers, it's always very important to be able to root um, their recommendations, their findings in those obligations. Um, and then hopefully this will, will achieve something as well. Um, of course, you know, how much this helps depends a lot on the country. And, and um, of course, um, the United States is a very special case. And how much, I mean, there will be international observation for the US elections. I'm not even sure if everybody knows that. So um, ODR, OEC, ODR will be there. They will make recommendations um, to be seen, of course, how, how serious this is taken in the US, for example, compared to other countries that maybe have to do um, you know, a more thorough job in, in responding to those um, findings. Um, one question or the first question to me was actually about the role of election commissions in regulating the use of social media. And I think that is a very um, diverse one depending on what countries you're looking at because depending on the country, the mandate of election commissions is going to be very different. And so sometimes it's a very um, technical implementation of um, electoral rules and nothing beyond this. Um, sometimes the mandate goes all the way as far as, as media monitoring. Um, and of course, depending on, on the, the mandate, um, the, the scope of action that an EMB can take is very broad as well. Um, but again, this, this, this whole thing of regulating um, social media and especially regulating the content of social media is something that at least in... in democratic countries, a lot of election administrations feel very uncomfortable with because it is exactly on that line that I was discussing before um, between, you know, protecting freedom of speech and protecting the right to form um, your own opinions. It's a really hairy issue. And um, what, what commissions often have to do at least is to make sure that everything that has to do with the process itself, uh, you know, disinformation about the process, I don't know, polling stations closed, because of I know, a landslide or because of COVID, all of those kind of fake news have been around already. So for sure, that is a responsibility of, of, of many election commissions to find that. Often there is also MOUs with the social media providers so they can work together to take um, this kind of misinformation down. But um, then the role of the EMBN, you know, also advising um, 
regulation and the legislator is, is really quite diverse. Um, there is an interesting additional complexity in this that um, the regulation that applies um, for social media is not only um, in the domain of the election commission, this also has to do with um, you know, data protection regulators, media regulators, advertising regulators. So it is an area that is also between different responsibilities sometimes. And one of the challenges here is also to get all of those actors kind of under one roof and, and have them all work together because of course, they also don't all have their expertise. You know, the election commission is not a data protection expert and the data protection ex um, uh, agency knows very little about um, electoral processes. So that's one of the constructive rights, I think, on the way forward. Um, the final question was about um, Facebook actions and if they are enough or is more regulation needed. Um, again, social media in general, not even looking at a specific platform have created very difficult, very distinct um, problems that have been recognized in the meantime. In my view, a lot falls on the providers at the moment, also for damage control and, and you know, kind of protecting their reputation to do things. Um, they have done a lot of things already, which I think are at least good starting points. Um, of course, they are sitting at the source of all the data and of all the possibilities as well. Um, and they also face some of the damage. Um, but but clearly that, that um, private companies are taking, you know, and even global private companies, right? And when you talk about the US, at least it's a company that sits in your own country. And when you are in, in other countries, it's even a foreign company that has to make all of those decisions. You know, what, what do we fa flag as, as, as misinformation? Um, how do we limit um, the campaigning? Um, you know, what kind of reactions do we, do we do? That a private company or several private companies have to make all of those decisions is is really uh, not an ideal situation, and and certainly it would be good um, if if we'd see more um, regulation, more unified um, rules about this that are not um, basically created by by companies. And and again, I would not even in the first instance blame the companies because there is just nothing else. Um, I remember in the early days of this discussion, some of the Facebook reps just said in election commissioners conferences, please tell us, you know, ideally, could you give us one standard that we should apply how to deal with this? You know, this was when they were still early in, in exploring this. So it's a hard issue and it should neither be with the, so it, it's it's not easy for the uh, companies and it should also not only be with companies um, to decide about all of this. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, for all of that information. And it's very, very helpful. Um, I think we we have heard from Kaylee that we should be able to get through. She may be able to reconnect with us. So um, it would be great to give her a few minutes. We also do have a question for her. Um, but I want to see if she wants to to take a few minutes to make any comments. Um, and then and then we do have a question for her if she'd like to answer it. So let's see if she can connect. Kaylee. Um, can you hear? We can hear you. You're still a little bit garbled. Okay. I'm I'm sorry. I think it's still it's still really garbled. Maybe if you wanted to write a comment, I could I could read it. The the connection is still is still too bad. I'm afraid. Um, it still sounds very it, very garbled. So we're not really able to under catch every word. And I don't think we want to not understand what you're trying to convey. So um, if you want to, you know, you could write a comment and everyone could see um, the comment there. And in the meantime, we do have, I mean, everyone's been um, very helpful in providing questions. So the same question could go out to our other two speakers if they're interested in, in responding or responding to each other's comments. Um, thankfully, we've had a very lively audience, so they've been they've been very happy to provide questions. So let me repeat the question, and if you both want to have a go at it, um, in some parts of the world, populations vote in elections based on ethnic affiliations, and the reality is that rival groups tend to trample on the human rights of others when elected. How are, democratic are such elections? Well, I can come in to this and. I'll actually approach it from a little bit of a different um, a different point of departure, and that is it's the wrestling we have with what is required for self-determination, right? So the static form of self-determination is that you simply have one vote and that vote is expressed. And again, it's not privileged or denied. 
But there's other parts that would argue there should be a dynamic approach, and that is that the voting process and the election of officials also reflect back democratic principles and norms. And But that eliminates this idea of just majority vote. And so we think this is what we're wrestling with. You can talk about ethno-nationalism or voting along um, ethnic or racial lines, or you can uh, talk about, as we are in the States right now, voting along what are perceived to be ideological differences. But it flips back onto itself. Do you then start to try to please the public square of who has the legitimacy on the, on the right to vote and what kind of systems can be put in place, uh, which have been put in place in other, in other um, constituencies that deal with kind of ethno-nationalist disputes. Things like consociationalism has been an experiment that was used in Northern Ireland uh, in which to make sure that even if you have uh, differentiations between groups that land on either ethno-nationalist or racial lines that you still have representation. So there's a lot of different ways of putting a political system in place meant to protect what we call quasi-democratic or democratic principles, um, but also allow uh, the, the right to vote and the expression of the right to vote to manifest. Thank you. Thank you for pulling it back into that that context as well. Peter, did you want to? Do you have a comment on that? Or are you do you, or any? So, so, sorry, uh, did you ask a question? The, the sound. Oh no, was, that's all right. Uh, I was just wondering if you had any last remarks on that on that question. But it, you've you've both spoken quite a bit and given us a lot of insight. So if you if you're good, then then that's yeah, fine. I think I'm good. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. So then I'll just send it back to Andrew then um, for last closing remarks. And thank you everyone for being such a fantastic audience and giving us so many questions and, and lively comments in the chat. Thank you very, very much. Danica, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Kelly, my, my heart goes out to you. It must be such a such a stressful ex experience of suffering these kinds of Zoom, Zoom, um, Zoom issues. Unfortunately, they happen to all of us. Um, we really, we obviously really miss the, the contribution you would have been able to make. Um, these, the, the, the chat has been fascinating, just watching the chat and seeing how, how engaged everybody is. It really speaks to, to a kind of challenge that we realized in actually devising uh, the session for, for, for today, which is it's such a, a huge area and trying to encompass or, or pick out some of the most important issues uh, in an area encompassing democracy and human rights, particularly at this point in time, particularly so close to the US presidential election and other really significant elections too, um, was a real challenge. I hope we've managed to, to, um, to provide you with a kind of uh, a snapshot of some key and enduring issues. Uh, your, the chat really illustrates just how, how important and how engaged everyone is on this. Um, apologies, we've not been able to get to all of those questions. Apologies, we've not been able to devise a, a webinar that could be as fully comprehensive to meet all of the, the interests that you have. Uh, I, hope you, I, hope you, I hope we've done the best we possibly could. I want to thank all of my colleagues behind the scenes who make all of this happen. Um, without them, this simply wouldn't be possible. Certainly at Diplo Foundation and Universal Rights Group, are, who are key partners, as well as other partners, of course, but key partners in this particular, particular um, venture of ours. Um, thank you so much to Kathleen and thank you so much to Peter. Thank you for giving up your time and sharing your expertise with us. We wait with bated breath on the outcome of the, of the US presidential <laughs> election. I dread to think what may actually ensue over the coming, the coming weeks. I, I'm, I'm happier to be ensconced in rural France than in, in Chicago, to be honest with you, but, but uh, let's, let's hope for the best and, and good luck on that. Peter, thank you so much, uh, likewise, for all of your expertise and, and interest in this. I'm sure we will be able to, to follow up with subsequent sessions exploring some of the issues and some of the, some of the, um, the questions that, that people rose in some other, some other format, a blog, perhaps. Um, it just leaves me to say thank you, all of you, uh, the, the audience. Thank you, wherever you are, for giving up your, your time um, to spend with us. I hope that you have learned something. I hope that whether you agree or disagree with, with the panelists' viewpoints, I hope that this has stimulated yet further, um, further engagement and further research into this, this crucial area. Our next um, write-on webinar is going to be focusing upon another incredibly urgent and pressing issue, which is climate change and, and sustainability. Um, please look out for the details on, on where and when that will be. Um, 
So on that note, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, stay safe and take care. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day. Goodbye.